Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October webinar for the Ascolite Televisors Network. I'm Colin Simpson. And today we are looking at all things multimedia and digital. Actually, let me just start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. But yeah, so we're looking at uh, all things multimedia. We've got a little bit of stuff about AI in teaching. We've got some stuff about 3D dinosaurs. Um, I think this should be a really fun session. I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm going to jump straight into it. And our first presenter is Greg Dorian. Greg is the manager of the learning media team at UNE. He works with his team to champion the creation, support and education surrounding high quality digital learning experiences using innovative technologies in a digital first approach. Um, so over to you, Greg. Excellent, thank you very much. I'll just quickly do the tests, make sure everyone can still hear me. Excellent, thumbs up, fantastic. All righty, let me just quickly jump to my slide deck. So today I'm here to have a chat about a journey through time and space, scanning dinosaurs and some other stories. Um, and I'm wanting just to have a bit of a nice um, open and transparent kind of discussion about some of the things that we've been doing here at UNE um, and some of the challenges that we have come across. Um, caveat being, you know, not all challenges are things that, that you can't overcome, but I think it's worth having a good conversation about the challenge that we have come across. Clicker not working. Clicker working. Fantastic. Okay. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the Anawan people um, and the traditional owners of the lands that I'm meeting upon here. Um, in Armadale and also pass, uh, pay my respects on to the past, present and future elders as well. All right, I'm gonna jump off the screen for a second so you can actually see this slide deck. Um, so when I jump into this showcase examples of what we will be looking at, um, it's worth mentioning that the team that, uh, that I manage here are a team of media experts and they're currently all starting to converge on the area of 3D and 360. Now, Specifically here, I mention um, 3D and 360, which might not be as attractive, um, but then words like mixed reality and VR and AR, but my focus is on building those blocks that make those experiences. And I believe that the final deliverable output, whether that is a desktop, a mobile, a tablet, um, AR headset, VR headset, igloo, or an experience room um, is actually gonna be user specific. Um, so just here, I have a little bit um, of uh, just a diagram here, kind of showing the kind of crossover and how these, um, how my team are actually converging in this area of, of 3D and 360 to build these, you know, to have these world building tools um, between them. So we have, um, I have videographers um, who also are drone pilots. They're stepping into 360 video, which blurs into the lines of my 3D technician who works from 3D video through to photogrammetry through to 3D light based scanning. And then there's a crossover there into 3D development, simulation, and 3D animation. So it's this kind of team that are all starting to come in around this area around 3D, which is really fantastic. All right. So I have two, two um, examples I want to talk about now. Um, the first two um, examples came from physical models, um, something that you, know, you actually have object-based learning artifacts in a physical room. Um, we went off and we scanned these objects. Um, oh, excellent, thank you. Um, we went and scanned these objects uh, with our Artex Spider, uh, a bit of hardware, um, and put them into Pedestal 3D for handling and assessment to try and handle, um, uh, trying to handle uh, how, how you actually use those 3D objects. Um, and then we also took those objects and we went further than just um, using them as these embedded objects in there and actually move those objects into simulation and 3D manipulation as well, which I think is a really, uh, really cool thing. So obviously the, the title of this slide was about a dinosaur. So I should probably, you know, stop talking about 3D and actually show everyone a dinosaur because everyone loves to see a dinosaur. All right, lightning claw, welcome to lightning claw. Lightning Claw, so how, how this um, came about was that we have a physical um, model down in the Natural History Museum here on campus in Armadale, and we had a new online unit coming um, around about dinosaurs. 
uh, and we wanted to um, use this opportunity to uh, stress test the hardware of the Arctic Spider and the computer to actually render and create um, the, the object itself. And then we wanted to actually take that a step further and actually build that into a virtual unit introduction where students can actually navigate a gamified introduction. Um, one, because to, to build engagement, but also because we're actually adapting the way in which we want to be teaching for our only online um, demographic. So what I really like about this is, as I kind of said, you know, you actually have a physical model that's sitting in a museum where we're scanning it um, anyway, because we wanted to be able to use that model itself inside of um, inside the course. But then we actually went a bit further and took it out of that and, and used that same 3D model and made it into this fun um, virtual unit introduction. Uh, we also wanted to provide equal access for remote students, which was everyone to be able to see um, Lightning Claw. Now I have seen there's a couple notes here of people saying, yep, thank you, Sarah, Sarah's on it. Um, yes, I'm happy to provide those afterwards. Sorry if they are a bit, uh, a bit small. Um, so here we, here we are, the, the unit was our ge our Geology 210. Um, as I said, there was a dinosaur that we have in the Natural History Museum. This is a seven meter long dinosaur. Um, we had to break that down into seven segments of scanning each. And when we'd finished with that, we had over 2 billion points of data to try and uh, ref uh, to render that into one final um, object. So as you could imagine, we'll need a graphics card and a processor that's going to be able to handle 2 billion points of data to reference and try and cram it all into one object. Um, I really wanted to stress test and go, how big can I actually go with the hardware that we actually have here? Because I know how small we can go and I can go as big as a car, basically. Um, and that's before, obviously, I start looking into decimation and bringing it down in size so that we can actually use it in a, in a usable manner. Um, so you'll see here, hopefully you can see here on my slide deck uh, over here, if I can get my pointer, E, there we go. Um, this was our virtual introduction that we, that we built based off the same model. Um, and then we went beyond that and, and dropped in a couple of Easter eggs and, and, and things so that when the students were actually clicking on those um, green floating orbs of where the, where the information was, we would change the lighting, we'd put a nice roar in there, you know, have, have a bit of fun with our 3D model now that we have it and we can manipulate it because we have the 3D model. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, one of the one of the inherent benefits of this was also that we got to build the relationship with a stakeholder, um, which then meant that uh, they knew about the media studios, which is one of the rooms I'm standing in here for presenting. Um, and they came and did all their lecture recordings in here in our media studios, once again, tailoring that content for their demographic, which is their online um, online only demographic. So that was my first example. That was my dinosaur. I'm going to jump across to another one. Oh, and I've forgotten to start my timer. That is unfortunate. Please, someone keep me accountable if I'm running too long. Colin, I can see you, so you can give me a, the, the stink eye. Um, so the second one was the Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. So once again, uh, similar idea here in that we had um, this Globe Theatre model was donated to a local school in the area, um, and it has been on loan to the university. Um, and so the project started as just a digital replica for the museum and to provide that access, uh, particularly obviously when COVID started happening and, and you know all the doors were closed. We wanted to still be able to show people this model. Uh, now you'll see here it's actually been wheeled in as the as the model. Um, the the second frame at the top there is actually us scanning that with the Artex Spider, and then basically what we're doing is we're going to take that model, hand it over to the three D. Um, I'll be calling the three D artist for reconstruction to be able to create um, the simulation of what we wanted. Um, as a fun little fact, we also used the DALI, um, the AI generated images for our characters, um, more or less because we could, um, but it's a really useful tool for us to be able to have, um, you know, uh, a series of characters with a certain type of um, outfit that we needed um, to be able to just get those generated on the fly for us. So that was a bit of a bit of a fun thing that we just threw on top because we could. So once again, we took the physical model, we scanned, uh, we scanned it and handed that over for reconstruction. And then now that we, once again, we have these actual objects, we can actually start um, trying to use those objects in, in different ways. So I say here, final renders being reworked for an Igloo Experience 360 tent. So the idea here um, was meant to be that now that I have these 3D objects, now I can start looking into what kind of experience do I wanna be able to have with these. So for students on campus, they can come into this, it's called an igloo, it's a, it's a 360 
with projectors right around and we can actually start running the simulation right around the room um, as we choose. Obviously, um, you know, if it comes to a point where we want to drop this into an AR headset, we have the models. Um, you know, we, we have the ability to have the simulation um, and we went through the different phases of what happened with the Globe Theatre, it burning down, um, the plans for the new model when it got closed, the rebuild. Um, and it was a really fun one that once again kind of started as just this kind of um, digital reproduction of, of what exists. And then we actually wanted to take those models in and push them further with the with the 3D artists and make a, a learning a further learning artifact out of it. All right, I have two more examples I'm going to quickly mention um, that are a similar thread, but more around the 360. So these next two examples um, have taken 360 images taken um, around a physical location in space. We once then again added additional 3D scans uh, for pedestal 3D object handling and assessment. Um, some additional videos recorded for a tour experience. Uh, and I mentioned here, my, my, my little gray bubble says our uh, future VR recording application. So whilst I, I think we've made some fantastic um, leaps with this, with what we've already created, I still want to go further. And I have this idea of um, actually recording in a VR application, which I'll, I'll mention in just a second. So the first project here um, was a digital heritage program. Um, so this one was really also um, a, a, nearly a, a research project to try and take on and actually figure out, hey, we've got this cool idea. What are actually, what, what are the hurdles? What are all the problems that we could come into here? Um, that could be access to the heritage listed locations. That could be the platforms, linking the digital platforms and seeing how they talk, um, all of these kind of things. And also using the hardware and software that we actually have at UNE and saying, is this actually going to be, you know, a real thing that we can use? So, um, as I said, it was a case study. We were using all, uh, we were using some different hardware and software between photogrammetry with our cameras, um, GoPros, the Rotec Theater 360 camera, the Artec Spider for the for the handheld scanning, and the ZF scanner, which we can we can see in the far left uh, image there, um, decimated to an inch of its life. Uh, but that was one of the ones that we were testing as well to see um, how it worked. Uh, we also uh, were testing out and looking into Pano 2 VR as one of our software providers, H5P, SharePoint 360, um, and also we're looking into Matterport as well as what are the tools here that are actually going to do the things that we want to do. Um, one of the goals was uh, the reactivation of the Heritage uh, Resource Centre, which once again, when the doors closed at COVID, um, kind of stopped in a way. So we wanted to try and bring new um, energy into that and also start building um, a stakeholder collaboration with an internationally connected industry partner. So what I mean there is, you know, starting those conversations with the industry partner, which was National Trust, which hold the keys to the heritage listed, heritage listed buildings. So trying to make that partnership to say, um, can we come in and start doing these scans? These are the kind of things that we're trying to create. Um, you know, we're happy to pass on the knowledge of what we learned and the and you know knowing what we were doing in the spaces. So they got the information of how can I actually make my own virtual tours in these spaces as well. Plus we have also start um, having the conversation about access into more heritage listed buildings to start using this for our inside our teaching and learning. Um, this one here was just one of the examples of what we were trying to do with this. Um, uh, and basically, uh, this one was was built out of Pano 2 VR, and we wanted to actually include a, an additional JavaScript library to push beyond what is actually just possible out of the box um, inside of um, you know the the kind of 360 tours. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to have um, say an image here of a stained glass window where we really wanted to zoom in and have you know um, very very close ups on the details of what was in each of the panels of the window. Um, and yes, you know it can throw we could have bought a link here to throw them out to another platform or we could have um, just had a, a, a zoom. But what we needed to do is try and to obviously make sure that that lighting was perfect so we could take a, a high res image on a, on a dedicated camera so that we could get that high quality detail. And you can see we've got the zooming and the panning that we can actually zoom right in on that, um, on that image. Um, so we wanted, as I said, to try and extend what we could get out of the box. And that was a custom JavaScript built inside of that. Um, in the continued experience that you can just close the window, continue moving around the 3D space and, and off we go. Okay, the next one um, we have been working on is a virtual geology field trip. 
So this one was actually taking um, some 360 shots of the property annually. Um, and this is a, an actual field trip that, that students go on and trying to provide either a, a, the same access online or supplementary information that people could come back and kind of go, oh, I remember I did do that thing. What was the thing that we mentioned? Where were we? Uh, what were we looking at? What was the context? Um, and this was one of those ones that we could do that. Plus also extending it beyond that, because obviously uh, when you hop in a drone and move higher in the, in the sky, you can't do that with your students unless you have a ridiculous budget. Um, so we were trying to replicate the same information from a field trip. We had 360 images. We had video content that we um, filmed in these media studios. And we had the kind of 3D scans, which you can see in the bottom panel here, which is um, once again, back in pedestal, um, where you can actually measure and have a close up look of, of the artifacts that are around. Um, and we're trying to improve um, the student uh, experience and access to what they could see in these tours. And uh, I'll just jump off the side here. Um, and the future VR, recording application. So this is one of the ideas um, that I wanted to look into, and it, this is my just down the road bit, um, is that kind of, I want to do a flipped model where instead of, you know, going out and, and following someone who's doing a field, um, a field trip and recording as we go, I want to go out and get all the recording of the location first, bring it back and actually get my lecturers to start doing the recording in the headsets themselves. So the advantage of that would be that the students would be able to have a guided tour, listening to the lectures with their little laser pointers pointing out what they need to. But at the same time, they can go, I'm looking exactly where they're looking. I can actually close this and I can continue to look around myself and make, you know, look at what I want to. But then they can bring up this kind of guided tour whilst they're looking through it. Now, is it possible? Yeah, of course, that's possible. <laughs> have I made it happen yet? No, I haven't, basically, because just around timing and, and trying to get people in to to get their head around oh wait a minute don't you have to don't i have to have the thing ready first um and and this kind of different experience of what that's like all right challenges okay i think i'm going okay for time um so the quote here that i have um at the top here is is my quote <laughs> so you know take it as you will um, whilst the technology is now available to create this kind of content, and it is available, the technology to consume this content on scale is still emerging. Um, and the challenges that I'm starting to speak about here are obviously relevant to the context of UNE, where we have, um, you know, most of our um, students off campus and online. Um, so the first one is downloads and specs. So when I'm looking at the size of the kind of work that we're working with, you're talking about gigabytes per model um, or you know lots of gigabytes maybe even terabytes into a lesson so one example i did here was five minutes recording in 360 footage was 1.2 gigabytes now obviously that's before decimation that's before we try and bring it down um, but there, there are actual real problems you know um, one are we actually asking our students and saying hey you know this week i'm going to need at least 50 gig out of your download bucket because we've got some exciting lessons that we're going to be doing you know, um, a lot of people might be fine with that. What about our person who is out in Tari and is on, um, you know, satellite dial-up? Well, that's going to be a, a, a tougher situation for someone in, in, in that area. Uh, does YouTube support 360 video scale uh, and low bandwidth? It does, but then I guess uh, then you're going to have to, uh, you'd have to weigh up the decimation versus the accurate representation. Um, if you're looking through a headset, is it, is it equal access if I'm looking through something that looks like a potato as opposed to someone who's actually having high high quality um, visualization of what they're looking at? As I said, they're not impossible challenges, but I think they're challenges still to be considered. Um, I'm glad someone mentioned 360 video inside of uh, inside of YouTube. Um, downsizing content that's not consumed is another one. Obviously, when you're talking about downloads and how much downloads you're talking about, um, it it doesn't exist for you to be able to say, well, clearly I can only see so much in front of me. Can I not be theoretically buffering some of the stuff? Well, no, of course you can't, because if I turn, I'm not going to want to wait for it to, to continue to buffer whilst I'm looking around in 3D. It's different if it's on a desktop and I can move that. But once again, if you use that into a, into a headset, then that's not exactly the same experience. Um, the hardware is emerging and can be expensive. Um, I, I have this on one of my key takeaways. And the next thing, I say can be expensive. Yes, you can enter the market with 360 video and it is cheap. Yes, you can go and get a GoPro. 
um, and you can start. But um, the, the scale in which it starts jumping can be expensive. You're talking about the difference between 360 video to start getting lenses for stereoscopic 3D, where you've actually got two lenses side by side to get that greater depth of field. Um, you know, you're talking about a couple hundred dollars to a couple of thousand dollars per lens that you want to start doing that video content. Once again, you know, I can do a scanner on my mobile phone. That's that's fairly cheap. We all have mobile phones. But then you look at the, the ZF scanner and you're talking of hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to, to have one of those. So, you know, um, and a lot of these bits of software that I've noticed, um, you know, that they can do their component really well. But the, the scaling complexity is kind of the cool. I like what it does there, but I want to do this and this and this. And the, the complexity goes goes rapidly up. Um, accessibility in 3D content. Once again, this is a challenge. It's not something that um, I think there, there are ways in which we can we can tackle some of this. But I'm talking specifically about accessibility with potentially 3D models. Um, because obviously, you know, if I think of the traditional accessibility um, of like an alt tag for an image might be okay because I can I can understand what it's talking about, or I might have a um, captions for a video feed. Well, if I'm looking at a 3D model and I change my viewport, then obviously the, the information I'm now looking at is once again completely different. Um, and you might be able to tackle that with things like annotations or alternate content or, you know, 3D printing, whatever these might be. Not a challenge that is um, that I think is, that you can't overcome, but it's just something you have to consider when you're actually starting to look in and build this kind of content. Um, my next one is uh, what seems smooth is normally chunking technologies in the background. So, like I said, um, you know, with the Pano Two VR one, um, th there's not one particular provider that'll do all the little bits for you. So, what does look like a smooth thing is I've loaded that library and that chunk of software for this thing, and then I'm going to load this one, which is Pedestal 3D, and all of its libraries in the background, and then I'm going to load this other JavaScript library on top of that one, and that one's doing its own thing, um, and there's not. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, a smooth transition, um, you know, unless you put in lots of time and lots of effort to try and go, well, you know, do I have a consistent UX between this, this piece of software and this piece of software and this piece of software in each of their own things, um, then it comes back to a lot of, um, a lot of time, a lot of considerations between that. Um, and while some of the components are particularly, I'm talking here about VR, um, things, whilst components have been tackled early, there are still, um, there are still issues um, with VR headsets. My lovely icon here is actually uh, a person vomiting, which is fantastic. Um, didn't think an icon existed for that. Um, I know, for instance, that when, I, when you get into VR headsets um, and a lot of people say, oh, yes, there's a certain demographic of people. Um, you know, it's, often it's, a, it's an older demographic of people who, who feel quite unwell when using um, VR experiences. And yes, they're, they're looking at ways in which they can tackle that. Um, uh, but that's something that it, even myself, who is, uh, I'm 35, um, that's something that makes me feel sick. I've, I've played on, um, on VR um, headsets before, and I last about four minutes before um, I basically tap out. What are my takeaways? And I think this is the, the last thing, and then I'm running close on time, so I'll try and, I'll try and um, wrap it up here. What are the takeaways? Keep on swimming. So I know I just mentioned a whole lot of challenges, but that's not to stop people from taking on these things. I think that the building blocks of what we're looking for and when, when um, the technology will keep will continue to move ahead so that the consumer will be able to actually be ready for it. Like I said, that's why my focus is more around 3D um, objects and the 360 objects. Um, and I think that, you know, as we continue to have those building blocks ready, the way in which we consume those products um, will become easier and easier um, because you can just drop these 3D objects into, into different um, areas. Um, I've already mentioned the kind of scaling complexity for time. I don't think I need to particularly go over it again. You know, my, my, my examples here are, you know, yes, I can do photogrammetry on my phone. Uh, what about multi-user VR experiences or adaptive 360 video content? Um, you know, it, it, it just gets more complex um, and, and it does scale up quite quickly. Um, and the last one is that the technology is not the lesson. Um, so, you know, whilst uh, using the technology is actually not, not, hugely challenging and the marketing of these um, these 360 cameras and, and all this um, hardware that we have is doing a really good job of going, yeah, you know, you can scan a whole building in a, in a couple of hours and you can, that's that's completely true. Um, the challenge is, I guess, is going beyond that then and going, 
you know, me taking the 360 photos is not the lesson. Um, you know, that that's something that that we can create quickly. But what we need is we need actual time to develop why we're doing it. And, you know, what are all the call outs? What are all the things and having that dedicated time to sit down and go, what are the other things that we want to be doing in this? Um, where I think some of the challenges we get is a much more practical, you know, oh, yes, you know, I know you can do it. Can you just come and do it? And we'll have it done by the end of the week. So that is my talk. So I'm happy to have any questions. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, I noticed, uh, I think um, Stu probably had uh, a couple of questions. Um, did you want to just go on um, on mic? Yeah, just ignore the chat. Um, that <laughs> that dinosaur thing was brilliant. Um, what was the platform that students were using to actually engage where it had the kind of faux Jurassic Park dinosaurs rule the world sort of sign up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we actually awesome. built we, we built that custom in uh, Verge 3D. Okay. Um, it's one of the platforms that we use for that. And could students actually like navigate through it? Yep. So you That's could awesome. use your, you know, your WASD kind of, you know, and rotate and move and open, you know, open doors um, and click on the interactive boxes and, and make it do things. Cool, what was that called again, sorry? Verge? Uh, the, the Verge, Verge, Verge. 3D. Okay, yep. th thanks. I, I also just had one very quick question because I'm a bit fixated on the use of um, AI um, image generation tools at the moment. So you mentioned you'd use DALI to populate yes. some of your characters. So were they just, 2D images that you put into the the theatre, or were they they weren't like mapped onto like 3D characters? No, yeah, no. That would we, be we, we, I mean, I've I've never tested it about how you could do that. Um, but for the the kind of style that we're doing, we're like we're happy with our 2D cutouts that kind of jump along in our mm. 3D um thing, and so we went cool. How are we going to get these these models quickly? Um, or you know, be able to actually find them or create them? So we went to Dali. Yeah, oh, it's so I mean, much fun. <laughs> I say, I'm not gonna lie, it was also a bit of a, oh, this is an opportunity to try and test that thing because, you know, a lot yeah. of people are talking about it now. So um, we wanted a chance to, to do that. Fantastic. Let me just have a quick look at the chat, see if there were right. any other. Um... I'm not gonna lie, I didn't overly read a lot of the chat, sorry. I was no, 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 not doing two at once. You're doing good. Um, Colleen's asking, do you use student experiences within the interactivity for the immersion experience? Um, did you want to expand on that, Colleen? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's amazing, Greg. Um, we don't have anything like that technology, but but what I'm trying to do is a very simple virtual tour of a field trip, as you mentioned there. But what I wanted to do was have like the sensory experience. You know, so if I'm going to go, what? how do I get what that feels like or what that smells like, what that tastes like, you know, that sort of stuff. And I don't know, I don't want any new easy technology, but I, th I figure there's a way you could probably do that by using student experiences, but I don't know what that is. So mm. I'm about to sort of try to think about that from an exploration point of view, but I just wondered. I haven't explored that. No, um, I mean, I know sensory experiences. I know that you can, um, you know, you, you can actually put like weighted things on things in augmented reality. So, you, you know, you could say, you know, as you have your controls, you could have your controls slightly heavier to try and provide a bit of feedback for the person using the experience, um, but not smells or, or things as such. Um, no, I'd like to know more from, from when you do it. Fantastic. All right. I think um, I have a question, Colin. Yeah, I can't think we've got time for one more. Sure. Okay, great. Hi, Greg. Um, my question is around the support side of things. Um, how, what's your current level of support for providing these to an academic? And is it something that you feel could be scalable or is it something you feel it's going to always continue to be some sort of high level of support required mm. to achieve the end result? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the, I mean, the actual creation of the objects, we've noticed that that's starting to grow and it's not just me and my team who, who do that. And that's the thing that goes into pedal stool 3D. Um, the 360 walkthroughs, once again, they're starting to get bigger uplift and we are trying to explore the whole, well, why don't we take the photos and then we hand it off. So it's a collaboration between who puts in the content and who maintains the content within the system. But once we start getting beyond that into either simulation or um, you know, the, those custom experiences, then I think that for at least the near future, 
um, will be something I'd have to come back to a team who can actually work with those specific tools. Mm. Does that yeah, answer? Part, yeah, I mean, the part that you mentioned about 360 tours, at least on the photo side, <clears throat> our team currently use H5P. Yeah. It's a virtual photo tour and I do a similar thing and I literally did it yesterday. I took the photos with the person, I handed it to him, showed him one or two scenes and then he's just going to make it himself. Yeah. And yeah, we've had good, good, uh, good success with that support model. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have H5P and that's one of the ones that we're being, we have been exploring as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I also like to try and go, you know, what, what might be entry level and okay for, you know, 50% of use cases and then what might be something that we want to really push beyond you know, maybe what H5P offers. Um, but we're, we're definitely exploring that. We also explored um, the, the SharePoint one, um, which is one of their 360 spaces. Um, H5P, I think, is easily one of the, the easier ones. You know, it, it's very, there's your, there's your call out, put in your text, happy days. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're, we're still exploring that. But uh, I guess um, the, the media team like to, I guess, take it beyond and stretch and go, okay, well, I know that we can do that what what's what's the next thing you know can we in, include a custom javascript library to do that can we um tr try and push it further i guess and just one quick question how big yeah. is your media team not that big about six about six people <laughs> um so you know i know i have this um fantastic shiny thing that i was just showing everyone um you know the the team um i have have kind of specialized skills on that first kind of slide where I kind of said, they're all kind of converging on this area. So it's one of those natural things that is starting to grow among the team more and more because like I said, the, the videographer is using 360 video and so is the person who's my 3D technician who's working on actual 3D scans. And um, so they're, they're kind of converging a bit. Um, you know, I'd love for that to be double the size so I could take on double the capacity. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, everyone can nudge Sarah for, the, for that one in, in, in here. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, we're, 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 we're a team of six and we, we take on, um, all kinds of video graphic design, um, you know, all kinds of learning artifacts and, and custom JavaScript things and, and development around, around those kind of things. Thanks. That's fantastic. Very uh, mindful of the time. So yeah, I will say, thank you, Greg. No, it's all good. It's all been very valuable. Mm -hmm.